Let's pray. Lord, we do invite your Holy Spirit here this morning that you would speak to each one of us by the power of your Spirit. We pray against any spirit of darkness, any spirit of confusion. We just ask for your Holy Spirit to rule and reign here that you might penetrate our hearts with truth. Lord, for any person who's here this morning and they are in a desperate place or hurting, we just ask for your comfort to be upon them, that you would lift them up and give them hope this morning. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Last week we were in Acts chapter 14, and we were looking at this scripture where Paul had encountered this person who was crippled, and he'd been that way since birth. And Paul was preaching, and of course he was sharing the gospel, which was his uh, mode of operating wherever he went. And it said that the man was paying attention to him, and undoubtedly there was something moved in that man's spirit. And then Paul looked at him, and the scripture says that he saw that the man had faith to be healed. Now, as I said last week, uh, teachers who'd, who've done it for a while can look at a student and know whether or not they understand and whether or not they are following them and so forth. Now, I know a couple of you are a little bit difficult, though, because you've tried to convince me that when you're asleep, you're also concentrating on what I'm saying. But, and maybe some people are gifted and able to do that. I'm not sure. But in any event, in this case, Paul was looking straight at this man, and he could see into his heart, so to speak. Now, maybe it was like a teacher who can see that a person is paying attention, or maybe it was a gift from the Lord just that the Holy Spirit revealed to him that this man had this faith, and also that the Lord gave Paul this wisdom to proclaim healing to him. In any event, he did speak, and the man stood up, and he was able to walk. Now, what we talked about a lot last week, sort of the focus of the whole teaching, was this idea that the man had faith to be healed. We went over and looked at the scripture that is really about salvation where it says that essentially faith itself is a gift from God. All of us are born separated from God. The sin nature permeates who we are. And as a consequence of that, there is nothing that you and I can do to draw ourselves to God. That we are in bondage to our own sin and even though we might try to do what appear to be righteous things, in reality, all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags before the Lord. And none of us could make ourselves good enough to come to his presence. And so it is that the Holy Spirit woos each person and he imparts faith to us. Now, as I've said many times, I think this whole thing about salvation, as well as many other things about human life, are mysteries. But there is this reality that somehow God, by the work of his spirit, penetrates the heart of a person and us, in our will, we receive or respond to that. It's not something that we create, but that we receive. And what we receive is this gift of faith. And then yet, once we receive faith as a gift, we must act upon it. And I believe this is the case as we go through life. In other words, God is about the business continually of building our faith. And see, if you decided tomorrow you were going to build your faith and make it stronger, I don't think any of us would really know how to go about doing that. That we might take upon a few small things, but in reality, the things that really build our faith are the things that we often shy away from. That is, the, the super challenges of life, the real difficulties. And so I believe that God himself is the one who builds faith in us, not against our will, but in cooperation with our will. And as we desire to know him and seek him, we are surrendering to him, submitting to him, and he's working even deeper faith in us. Now you stop and think about this, especially those of you who are a little bit older, like at least 35, okay? Now really, if you've been, say, a little further in life, past midlife or something, is it not true that you have encountered things, say in midlife, that if you had encountered them as a young person, you would have completely fallen apart? In other words, that there are challenges in life that come along, maybe like death of loved ones or serious health problems or loss of a job or things like that. Challenges that as a very young person in your faith, you might have fallen apart. 
but as a person who had some years of maturity that you dealt with those in a way in which you had a, a confidence and assurance that God was with you no matter what. And you see, the recognition of that is the reality that your faith is growing, your trust in Christ is growing as you're moving through life. Because there are things that you could not possibly have dealt with as a young person that you face later in life and you face them without fear, but with trust in Christ. And so this is the whole essence of what we were talking about last week. In, in the case of this man who was, uh, had the faith to be healed, we don't know how old he was, but we assume he's an adult. He's been in this crippled condition for a long time. Somehow God worked faith in him at this point, and that he was responding. There was something in his will that desired to know God, to walk with him, and his his response, his openness was the conduit for the power of God to come upon him to heal him. And you see, I, I do believe that in the church, particularly in the United States, there's some misnomer about what faith is. We often tend to think of it as something that we conjure up. But it's something that God is creating in us, yet we are the ones who have the will to say no to or to act upon faith. And when you act upon faith, what you're doing is opening the road, so to speak, for the Spirit of the Lord to work in you in a more powerful way. Now, I want to continue in Acts. And as, we've, as you've known, if you've been here, we've been going on this circuitous route all over the place in the book of Acts. And, and we were in 14 last week, and now we're going in reverse and going back to 13. Okay? Now, we were talking about Paul last week, and essentially 13 talks about the initiation of his first major missionary journey. And uh, to start, we'll go here where it says in the very first verse that in the church at Antioch, there were these people who were prophets and teachers. There was Barnabas and Simeon and this man Lucius and Manon and then also Saul. Now, of those five, I referred to them as the fab five just because I was having a bad day. But, um, but of those five, we really only know a lot about Barnabas and Saul. But it is significant that the Scripture records these people as prophets and teachers. Now, if you've been here the last few weeks, we've talked about Antioch and what's important about it. It became the central part of the expansion of the northern church, that is, north of Jerusalem, in that realm of the world. That Antioch was a very critical place. Apparently there, there was a real revival and outpouring of the Spirit and many missionary things went out from there. And so these five people who are listed are undoubtedly five of the most critical leaders at Antioch. Now, we're going to talk about Barnabas and Saul a lot. We don't really know anything else about Simeon and Lucius, but we do know this thing about man in here. It says that he had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Now, this was probably Herod Agrippa, which was the third Herod that we were talking about a few weeks ago. And so, undoubtedly, this man was a person of privilege or status as a young person, that he had all the accoutrements of being a, a person of wealth or status in society, having been brought up with Herod. And yet, he is now a person who has chosen Christ, and he is clearly a leader in the church at this time that he has apparently given up his status of wealth and power, whatever it might have been, in order to pursue Christ, and he's become a strong leader in the church here in Antioch. Now, so the focus, though, is really upon Barnabas and Saul. And it says, while all of these folks were together and they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, that the Spirit came upon them and, set up, and said, set apart for the ministry to which God had called them, Barnabas and Saul. And so they placed their hands on them, and they prayed for them and sent them out. Now, there are two or three things there that I want to talk about. And, and really, in today's teaching, there's not one central theme. You know, I often talk about if there's one nugget that I hope you take away. There are two or three different nuggets that are a little bit disconnected. That they're all part of this scripture here that I want to focus upon. The first one is here where it says that they are worshiping the Lord and fasting. Now, we assume they were worshiping somehow maybe in song or whatever it might be. The Scripture does talk about sharing and songs and hymns together. And, of course, they didn't have a keyboard or they didn't have an electric guitar or whatever it was, but certainly they would have had this capacity and this desire to worship the Lord. But then it says that they were also fasting. And I want to take a little time to talk about fasting. 
In fact, um, a few months ago, I did an entire teaching on fasting in Celebrating Freedom. And I do believe that fasting is something that is sort of overlooked in the modern church, but it's something that is still very important in our Christian journey. <clears throat> now, really, when one fasts, what you're essentially doing is denying your physical needs for the purpose of what? The purpose of focusing upon and listening to the Holy Spirit, to focus upon Christ and receive direction from him. The scripture even talks about spirits that only come out by prayer and fasting, which was the primary thing that I was talking about in CF, is this, that I believe fasting is important in breaking bondages. That is, that you declare a time when you're going to seek the Lord and deny your physical desires, and really you're, you're submitting to the Lord, and I do believe there is power there to break bondages that is, you're inviting the Spirit to work in you in a more powerful way. And whether we realize it or not, any of us can be in bondage to some desire of our flesh. Now, you stop and think about that. God has given all of us natural desires that are a part of the body. Natural desires. And they are good, submitted to Him. But any of us could become in bondage to a desire of the flesh, like, like overeating or you could have sexual perversion or any of those things, natural desires of the body that become something that are a bondage to us. And so part of the struggle in human life is not only developing self-control with, with the things that I say and stuff like that, but it's also self-discipline with this body that is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And fasting is a powerful means to maintain self-control and submit to the Spirit. Now, most often when we're talking about fasting, we're talking about fasting of food or something like that. Now, I've never done a 40-day fast. I had a friend who's now passed away who did a 40-day fast twice. The second time, he went beyond 40 days. Now... Many people, though, instead of doing something like that, maybe some of you have, most people, fasting is a smaller scale thing, maybe for a few days. Or maybe even it's one meal a day. Now, some of you grew up in religious traditions where you were to fast for a certain time period or something like that. If you're doing it for the wrong motive, it's not helpful. You know, there are, I think, some diets out there and some cleansing type things that encourage you to fast. Well, if you're doing it for that, that's not really a spiritual purpose. Now, that might be okay for you physically, but we're talking about fasting where your motive and your heart's desire is to draw close to Christ. And I really do encourage you to consider incorporating fasting in your life, at least on a somewhat periodic basis especially when you face a time of, let us say, you feel like you're oppressed or you're confused or you lack direction or something of that nature. You see, they are fasting in order to do what? To receive direction from the Lord. And it says the Holy Spirit spoke to them in this time period. Now, let me add to that, that in the world in which we live, I do believe that there are other types of fast that would be helpful to us in our life. Particularly, I believe that a fast of technology can be helpful to us. Really, there are many people who are essentially addicted to technology. Now, in, in the age that I am, when I was a little kid, now I know some of you younger people are going to be thinking I lived on another planet, but there were only three channels on television. They were black and white. They weren't doing that for dramatic effect. That was all they could do was black and white. And one of the stations didn't come in well. It was always fuzzy, and you had to go adjust the antenna or the rabbit ears, right? There are people in my general age category shaking their heads saying, oh, yes, the good old days, right? And there were no cell phones, right? No computer, no laptop computers, personal computers. The only computers in those days were mainframes, they were called, and they were the size of a football field, and they could do less than your personal computer can do today. 
Now, that seems like an age of antiquity, even to me, right? But you see, the fact is that from that time period, during my lifetime, as in anybody's lifetime, you see a lot of things change, and particularly the largest change probably has been in this area of technology, most of which is wonderful. I mean, I love the fact that I can communicate with people around the world almost instantaneously. Like Michael Broyles, the missionary that we support in Haiti. You know, he sends prayer requests on his Facebook account and things like that. And I, and I appreciate that I can stay connected to people around the world. Or like I mentioned this guy, Renato, that I met in Brazil that I just so loved. And, and I stay connected to Renato. I love that. But is it not true that technology can control you? that you have this compulsion about got to check my text messages or got to check my email or whatever it is or check my Facebook account and that it can own you and take away many hours from your day. Now I have a son who's a student at the University of Tennessee and uh, he tells me that it is amazing how many of the people he is around spend many, many hours every day simply doing one thing. Do you know what it is? Gaming. Gaming. That, you know, doing online games or whatever it might be. And it's just amazing to him even how they're spending hours and hours every day doing this because he's like, I need those hours to just do my classwork and so forth. So forth. And uh, there is this reality that there can be an addictive pattern that develops in this area. And so I would encourage you to consider not only fasting in the area of food or things like that, but there may be other areas in which you need to fast. Now, occasionally I've tried to fast from mowing the yard, but that hasn't worked that well. Uh, but it just, you know, just doesn't seem to respond the way I would like. But I, I would encourage you to consider this as a part of your Christian journey, Okay. So now in this case, it says that Paul and, uh, I mean, Saul and Barnabas, he's later called Paul, that uh, they are set apart for the work to which they have been called. And even there, I think there's something very important. What is the primary work to which Paul and Barnabas were called? Missions. I'd say primarily evangelism, that they were evangelists, gifted in that area. Paul was also a gifted teacher, and obviously also a gifted writer. But I would say his first primary thing to which he was set apart was this thing of being a, an evangelist. Now, you may not think of this, but I've been trying really for years to get all of us to think in the, in, with a mindset that you too are set apart for a specific journey and a specific duty in this life. You may not be gifted as an evangelist. You may not be gifted as a teacher. Some of you are. But you are gifted in various ways. Just as I look around the room and the people that I know here, I know some of you are gifted with mercy and some of you are gifted like in the medical field or as teachers or some of you are gifted with art or whatever it might be. And I believe this. I believe that God instills in every one of us certain gifts literally at birth. That when he knits us together in our mother's womb, there are certain gifts that we have. I mean, some people from a very young age, you can see that they are gifted with the ability to sing or things like that. Or some, they have a strong gift of mercy from a young age or whatever it might be. And I believe that there are these gifts that are a part of the personality that he has given us then as we seek him and we come to know him and we're filled with his spirit, his spirit then amplifies and multiplies those gifts. He may even originate new things in you and give you new gifts. And then as you journey through life, I believe that what God wants to do is this interaction between the natural gifts that he's given you, the work of his spirit in you, and the things that he has prepared for you to do in advance that he works all of these things together, really, that you two are set apart for a certain work in this life. You may not think in those terms, but this is the reality of every day. That there are things that God calls us to if we are seeking him and being obedient, that is our work to which we are set apart. So in this case, they placed hands on, on them and they sent them off. And it says the two of them were sent on their way by the Holy Spirit. 
And I believe this is the same thing for you and I. That each day, you and I are sent on our way by the Holy Spirit. Now again, you may not think in those terms that you wake up each morning and say, okay, Lord, where is it that you want me to go today and how do I minister? But in reality, that's what's going on. It may be just sort of a routine thing that you go through each day. You get up a certain time, go to work and so forth. But your job that day is to be the minister of Christ to the people that you encounter. And it is the Holy Spirit who carries you. Now, I'll be honest that there are plenty of days where I don't think in those terms. But then there are certain days it's sort of like, oh, you just have some experience. You're in a place at a certain time, and you just know that the Holy Spirit puts you there and that he is working for a specific purpose on that day. In fact, I had a little, little tiny such occurrence yesterday morning. I stopped at the, I think it's a Chevron. It may have changed ownership right out here next to McDonald's just to get gas. And as I got out of the car and I was going to pump gas, I looked at this car over on the other side, and it had Massachusetts t tags, right? And there was this sweet African-American lady standing there, and I just, she was by herself at the time. And, you know, I was a little hesitant to talk to her because she was by herself. I didn't want her to think I was flirting with her or something. But, but she, she just turned and looked at me, and I just said, Hi, I see you're from Massachusetts, the tags on her car said, right? And, um, and she said, Well, I live there now, but I'm from Mississippi. She just started talking, so I was, it was all fine. We just started chatting a little bit. We became friends real quickly, and she was pumping gas, and I was pumping gas, and she said she was on this long trip. Uh, I forgot where she was headed at this point. I think maybe she was heading back to Massachusetts, and, um, and I just I, I prayed for her, but I tried to do it sort of subtly. I said, I just pray that the blessings upon you today, I think is what I said. And she said, oh, I receive it. <laughs> and I thought, bingo, I have encountered one who knows him. And so then my prayer became a little bit more elaborate. And really, we were just friends for a moment. And then she had these two little kids that came out. And she's in this small car. It's just her and these two little kids traveling on some distance. And so they got in the car, and she waved as she's pulling out. And I prayed that the angels of the Lord would surround and protect her on her journey. Now, I do believe that the Holy Spirit put me there just to bless that lady and to pray for her on her journey. That's what I mean by you're sent on your way by the Holy Spirit, and sometimes it's something that specific for another person. I won't see her, I'm sure, again until heaven. But I got a feeling when I do, she'll be coming over going, Brother Robert! <laughs> and I'll be glad she's coming, right? Now, it says that they went on and they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. As we said, Paul had the right to do that because he was a Pharisee. And, um, but notice this last sentence, which is almost just like a little footnote. It says, John was with them as their helper. This is John Mark. He's referred to sometimes as Mark, but uh, often referred to as John Mark, Okay. Now, we're going to come back and talk about him later as we go through this. Well, it says, as they're in this area and they're traveling around, they encounter this opposition, and it says that this person is a Jewish sorcerer who is a false prophet, and he has the name Bar-Jesus, which is a bit of an unusual name, don't you think? It says he is the attendant of the proconsul, this guy Sergius Paulus. Now, let me go on, and then I'm going to come back a little bit and talk about Bar-Jesus says that the proconsul was an intelligent man that he sent for Barnabas and Saul, and he wanted to hear what they were saying. Undoubtedly, he had heard about them. He believed there was something there of significance. He wanted to hear the word of God. And this guy, Bar-Jesus, now he's also referred to as Elimus here, this sorcerer. He's got these two different names. One is sort of his root name, and the other may be a title. And some people believe that what happened was that he gave himself the name Bar-Jesus. Now, the name Bar-Jesus is odd-looking, but here's what it means. The bar part means son. So the name means son of Jesus. Now, look what he is. He is a false prophet. He has undoubtedly heard about Jesus. Some, <coughs> excuse me. Some people believe that he gave himself the name Bar-Jesus to say that I am a son of Jesus like Jesus himself said he was what? Son of God or son of man. And that he may have been using this title to try to intimidate people with he was somebody. But it says that he is a sorcerer. 
meaning he's like a magician or he's one who's doing things that are, is not of God, yet he is an attendant to this proconsul. Now, when this guy, Sergius Paulus, invites Barnabas and Paul to come and uh, speak with him. Did I say Barnabas? I was trying to say Barnabas, but I got a little bit over on Paul there at the same time. See, I should have been born in the north because my mind is faster than my tongue, you see. But in any event, it says that, that uh, when he sent for, the, for Barnabas and Saul, that undoubtedly the sorcerer got uncomfortable. That he didn't like the fact that these guys were imposing upon his position and he's trying to oppose them and prevent the, the proconsul from coming to a place of faith. Now, there's something that I think that very important that occurs here, and it's this. It says that Saul, or Paul, as he is also called, looked straight at him, that is, at this sorcerer, and he said, you are a child of the devil, an enemy of everything that is right, that you are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery, and he even says, will you never stop perverting the ways of the Lord? That last statement there makes me think that Paul has been aware of this guy for some time, that it's not just a sudden thing, but he's had some awareness of him because he says, will you never stop doing this? But he looks at him and says, you are a child of the devil. Now, there's something important here. There are times in life where you need to exercise extreme care and wisdom and caution in how you deal with things. In fact, in most all circumstances where there's any measure of conflict, you need to do that. There are times, however, where you need to be strongly confrontational when you encounter something that is spiritually not of the Lord. Now, sometimes that form of confrontation is simply in prayer, that you are aware of something that's demonic, that's influencing you or somebody else, and you join together in strong confrontation in prayer. In other words, not directly face-to-face -face with another person. But there can be times where you need to confront that directly that which is not of the Lord. Now, the closest I've ever come to something like this occurred on the doorstep of my house. And what happened was, and you might guess what happened, uh, two Jehovah's Witnesses showed up, okay? Now, in the past, I have in actually invited Jehovah's Witnesses in and had a talk with them and uh, a little debate and got to the point where they were ready to leave. You know what I mean? I mean, I didn't push them out. They were like, it's time for us to go now, all right? But in this case, what happened was I opened the door, and as soon as I opened the door, I had this overwhelming sense of something was very wrong right in front of me. I mean, just instantly, it was like, whoa. And standing there was a man who was, I would say, close to 40, and a teenage boy. And he may have been 18 or 16 or something, but he looked like he was about 13. He was a very young-looking man. And so this older man started to give me the Jehovah's Witness spiel. And, of course, I started to try to rebut some of the things that he was saying. But I have never encountered anyone so slick and so direct and so forceful as this man in presenting something that was uh, a lie. And the longer that he and I began to talk, the more I realized that I was not arguing or debating with a person, but it was with a spirit. It was a lying, deceiving, religious spirit. And I knew it very clearly. And what started to happen was anger started to arise in me. Now look, the scripture says, be angry and do not sin. Anger in and of itself is not wrong. In fact, anger sometimes is there. God has given us the capacity to become angry to cause us to arise in what is necessary to be done in that moment. And anger began to arise in me. And I began to confront this man very, very sternly. I don't think I have ever confronted anybody so sternly in my life. And what I said to him specifically, most importantly, was you are on very dangerous ground leading this young man astray into what is a lie and a, something that is a blasphemy to the God, God himself. And this went on for a while. And, but it was right there. I mean, as soon as I opened the door, boom, there was something that was not of the Lord right before me. 
And there was no place to be gentlemanly or cautious. It was clearly something to confront. Now, what I hope more than anything, I doubt that man was freed or anything affected him whatsoever. What I hope was that the young man encountered and saw that there's something wrong with what's happening with this guy and that somehow he found freedom. But I think primarily my anger was from the spirit, and it was probably the spirit who was angry about this young man being in this situation. But there is a place for confrontation. Now, sadly, too many people confront harshly when it's unjustified. You know, people get out of their cars and get in fights because somebody cut them off in the street. Well, you know, that's not exactly wise. There is this reality, though, that at times you will encounter something that is clearly demonic in the form of another person, and you must have wisdom in how to confront it. Now, sometimes, as I say, though, confronting it is simply praying about it strongly, but not addressing it directly. Because sometimes addressing it directly can be a negative situation. But in this case, this is what Saul does, and he says this. He says, now the hand of the Lord is against you. Now, I want to dwell upon that statement. Because that, that would scare me, that would petrify me. That if the hand of the Lord was against me. Now, essentially, all of us were enemies of God before we came to know him. I didn't think of myself in that term, but I know in retrospect, yes, I was an enemy of God. And so his hand was against me in the sense that he had to bring judgment upon that. But at the same time, his hand was extended to me to offer love and grace and redemption and all those kinds of things. But here is a case where a person has stood opposing God and the hand of the Lord is against him. Now... I think it's healthy to have a reverent fear of this very thing. I do not want the hand of the Lord against me. In fact, I was talking recently with a gentleman. We were talking about the subject of adultery. And I said, literally, it would scare me in that area because I believe that God would bring such harsh judgment upon me that I don't want to come anywhere close to that. And you see, there is this problem, I believe, in our society that there is a, a, a sort of a pervasive lack of a proper fear of the hand of the Lord. Now, you know, I don't preach fire and brimstone and things like that, and I'm not talking about a fear that is sort of a, a condemning kind of fear. I'm talking about a reverence of the reality that God is the one who created all things, that he is all-powerful, that our lives exist because he has said they exist, and our lives will end according to the days that he has numbered. And it is a wise, wise thing for a person to have a healthy, reverent fear of the hand of the Lord. Because I do not want to displease him. Look, I did enough things to displease him and anger him and disrespect him in the years before I knew him. Now that I know him, I don't want to go on that journey. I want to do whatever I can to honor him, to please him, to, to follow after holiness, even though I may fail from time to time. And it is a wise thing to have a healthy fear of the Lord. I've talked with various couples where this issue of adultery has arisen. And I have said to the non-offending spouse, your problem is not really between you and your spouse. The problem is really between your spouse and the Lord. That your spouse lacks, or first of all, your spouse is in rebellion against the Lord and lacks a reverent fear of him and therefore disdains or disrespects the marital covenant. And you see, really, in that situation, although it's an interpersonal relationship, the real problem is between the individual and the Lord. Because if that individual was 
deeply submitted to and wisely feared the hand of the Lord, that would not occur. And you see, in this case, this man is a sorcerer and he has stood against God and now Paul proclaims the hand of the Lord is against you. And he goes on to say that immediately he became blind. It appears that it's blindness for a temporary time period, but nonetheless, that he's blind for a time period. The proconsul sees what happens and he believes. In other words, the, the, this Roman leader that he had wanted to understand truth and the one who was standing in between him essentially became the vessel by which he saw it was clearly the hand of God that was at work. And you see, God will accomplish his plans and purposes even if humans stand against him. You know, it really is amazing that God can allow us the freedom to make lots of choices in this world, but yet he already knows the end. And when you read the book of Revelation, this is, this is what amazes me. If you read the book of Revelation in the year, say, 1850, you might have a hard time fathoming how some of those things would come about. Today, it is easy to fathom how they would come about. I mean, just very easy, like, like the mark of the beast to buy and sell. Well, uh, we're getting there quickly. And you see, there is this reality that the hand of the Lord knows the beginning from the end, and standing against him is a very unwise thing. Now, lastly in this scripture, I want to go back to one little thing that was said there. It says that Paul and his companions, they moved on, and they're at Pamphylia, and there that John left them to return to Jerusalem, which seems like a pretty minor thing. You know, he had been with them. He was their helper, and then he left, and he went to Jerusalem. Seems like another little footnote, and you don't seem to have to worry a whole lot about it. But however, I want to jump over and talk about that for just a minute, because in Acts 15, it says this. It says, sometime later that Paul said to Barnabas, Let's go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we had preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. In other words, what he's saying is, look, Barnabas, let's go back to all those places that we went on our missionary journey before and check on them. In fact, I know like some people here in this church, you know, we've had a connection with folks in Brazil and Teresina for a while, and they've been back more than once. They want to go back and check on them. You know, it's a very understandable thing. Well, so in this case, Paul says, look, Barnabas, let's go do that. And Barnabas said, uh, well, let's take John along. See this part, the one John Mark? He said, let's take him along. But Paul did not think it was wise because he had deserted them in Pamphylia. In other words, these two little scriptures that are there in 13, that John's their helper and then John leaves to go to Jerusalem, seem like almost uh, non-issues. But later, when Paul and Barnabas are thinking about going on this journey, Paul says, no, let's don't take him. And notice how the scripture says, because he had deserted them in Pamphylia. In other words, this guy had not continued to persevere. He had not continued to be loyal. And Paul does not what? He does not trust him. And it is apparent that John Mark had made a commitment that he did not fulfill. Now, sadly, in our culture, there are lots and lots of people who are making commitments that they do not fulfill. And I think as a Christian, essentially not fulfilling a commitment is essentially lying or stealing. You know, if I, like I had these guys that I hired to do some drywall work at my house many years ago. And um, on Friday, they got close to finishing, but they didn't finish. And they wanted to be paid for the work they had done. And so I paid them. Not, I didn't pay them for work they were going to do. I only paid them for the work they had done. And uh, they were supposed to come back, and they probably could have finished in one more day, maybe two more days, okay? Can you guess? Never showed back up. They wanted to be paid on Friday for the weekend, and they thought it's not worth going back to finish the job. And I had to get somebody else to do it and do part of it myself. And they, did, they had said they'd be back on Monday. I mean, they clearly said, yep, we'll be here Monday, so forth. Mm, nope, never saw them. And you see, essentially what they did was they lied to me. They didn't steal because I didn't pay them in advance. Sometimes that happens. You know, you pay somebody for a job and you expect them to finish and they don't finish. That's stealing. So Christians should be people who are loyal to their commitments and fulfill whatever they say they will do. And that apparently is what John Mark had not done. 
And so it says here that a sharp disagreement developed between Barnabas and Saul, or Paul, over John Mark. Now, apparently John Mark was the nephew of Barnabas. So it is a partly a family issue for him. He's trying to give him a second chance, things like that. But Paul's saying, nope, not going to deal with it. And sadly, the two of them ended up separating company. That they go on their way and go in different directions for missionary work. Now, Barnabas then fades from the scene. We don't know much more about him. And of course, the rest of what we do know about missionary journeys is primarily about Paul. Now, some people say, well, that was good. God multiplied their journeys. They now had new traveling partners. Silas went with Paul and so on. It's not good that they left, on, left each other's company on bad terms. And the scripture does say this, that make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. That you and I should always work to maintain unity, especially with those who are other Christians. And, you know, this is one of the things I like about this church is that we, we reach out, we support other churches, like especially like the singles ministry has on the leadership team people from other churches that we try to create a bond of unity. I, one of the things I've been doing personally is trying to, to interconnect with other ministries, uh, that is, other churches or other ministries in the Tri-Cities, just to try to break down barriers. Like I met with a pastor recently and had lunch from another church and um, with a group of pastors a few weeks ago about a, a different kind of issue. And, and, and I went to WCQR this week just to say to them, we support you because you're a part of the body of Christ in the Tri-Cities. And it is a wise thing for all of us to try to maintain unity in the body of Christ, if at all possible. Now, in saying that, I would assume that for some people here, maybe several, there is at least one relationship that you have that is broken. Maybe a family relationship where there is disunity, maybe with somebody that's been a friend or a Christian brother or sister, whatever it might be. And it is our responsibility to do everything we can to reconcile with them. The scripture even talks about the ministry of reconciliation. And it is our responsibility to do everything we can to bring unity. Now... In some cases, there's nothing else you can do. You have to turn a person over to the Lord, and when he opens the door, then you are ready to reconcile. But there's some people that there's nothing you can do. I understand that. But to the extent that it is possible for you to initiate reconciliation, you need to do so. And in fact, the burden falls upon the more spiritually mature person. In other words, if you see the other person reacting immaturely and things like that, the burden falls upon you. In fact, I was talking with a gentleman recently. He'd had a, had a relationship in his family that had become fractured, and, and the other person is acting very immaturely, but, and this person was trying to already do some things to reconcile, and so far it hadn't worked, and he was telling me, well, the next thing I'm going to do is write a letter and see if that'll work. In other words... He recognizes the immaturity on the other person's part. He's trying to overcome that and look over that in order to maintain a spirit of unity. Now, there are a lot of things in this particular passage, but perhaps that is the one that is most important. Because I entitled it Facing Resistance, and you saw they, that Paul and Barnabas, they faced the resistance of this guy Bar-Jesus and things of that nature. But, you know, sometimes resistance is not out there, and it's so obvious. Sometimes resistance has crept through the back door or the side door, and it's creating disunity in your family or in some other situation. And there is a spirit that has gotten some stronghold that is trying to create division and disunity. In fact, I believe one of the things that the spirits of evil always attempt to do is bring disunity within any body of believers. I read a book about this not too long ago, and, uh, and this person was talking about that uh, the spirits of evil try to bring disunity in one of three places in every church. In the elders or deacons, whatever you want to call them, sort of the leadership board, or in the staff, or in the congregation itself. And sometimes in all of them. 
And in reality, you look around and think about the church experiences you've had, and sometimes those things happen. And there are these not-so-subtle attacks, sometimes subtle attacks, trying to bring disunity. And it is important that you and I work at all times to maintain unity, whether in the church or in family or in other settings. Well, let's pray. Lord, I do pray that the spirit of unity would pervade this church, that whatever issues develop between human beings and individuals, that you would be the one who would maintain the spirit of unity, that we would be humble before you and allow you to work in us and through us. Lord, for every person here today, you know where we are in life. You know our needs, our fears, our desires. And I ask, Lord, that you would meet each person in a special way this day. That you'd give encouragement to the brokenhearted. We ask for your healing upon those who are sick in any way. We pray against any spirit of Satan that has any stronghold upon any person here, any spirit of addiction, any lying spirit, any deceiving spirit. We pray against those in the name of Jesus and by the blood of Jesus. We pray for freedom and liberty among us, Lord, that we might honor you and worship you in all things. We pray this in the name of Jesus.